Go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As you do that, let me be maybe the first to wish you a happy Reformation Sunday. If you are not familiar with why today is called Reformation Sunday, I'll give you a history about it here in a minute. And then you'll know why we are going to watch the movie Luther tonight. Let's see if I can find the passage for, in my own Bible. What's that? What's the movie Luther about? Give me one minute and I'll tell you. All right, follow along with me as I read the first 11 uh, verses uh, of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then I will pray. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was the I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. Heavenly Father, we thank you that there are those in our lives who were faithful to preach, and so we believe. And Lord, we know that it is not our accomplishment it is not something in us that causes us to believe but that it is your spirit who regenerates our heart who uh, makes us go from a state of hating and despising you to loving and desiring you and it is not a work or accomplishment of our own that affects that change in our life but that you have accomplished that in us and so we believe Father, we thank you that we uh, can be considered and counted among those who believe and that we might have our lives renewed and our future secured. That Christ, in our place, bore your wrath on the cross so that you might be made favorable towards us and that we might spend eternity uh, in your gracious blessing and presence rather than under your eternal wrath. We are grateful that you have accomplished all of that for us. Father, instruct us in your word. Father, we know right here from this book, 1 Corinthians, that we're in now, that we have been given the mind of Christ and we have been given your Holy Spirit that we might know the things that are from you. Let us know the truth of the gospel. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is Reformation Sunday because it is the closest uh, Sunday whoa, of the year uh, to the anniversary of the Reformation. Is that me? Something's happening up here. I don't know what's going on. Something huge is happening. It's Reformation Sunday. That's right. Okay, so um, we, most of us probably know or have at least heard of who Martin Luther is. I'm going to give more of Luther's story tonight before we watch the movie. But Luther, if I might nutshell it as fast as possible, was a Catholic monk who was uh, well aware of his own sin. And well aware of his own nature. And was very discontent with the Catholic teaching that somehow his works could contribute to his salvation. And so um, there are many precipitating events, but he was reading Romans and came across the verse in Romans that says, is that my mic doing that? <laughs> 
Are any of the other channels on? I'm not sure exactly what's going on here. Uh, anyways, he came across the verse in Romans that said that the just shall live by faith. And he um, placed his faith in Christ for the remission of his sins. One of the difficulties he had with the Catholic Church at that point in time was their selling of indulgences. That is, you could pay money to the Catholic Church, you could get a, a document that stated that you paid money, and, by, and in doing so, you could buy time out of purgatory for your loved ones. If you've ever seen all of the buildings in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica and all of that, that's how they paid for it by selling indulgences to poor people to get their money to further their agenda. Well, on October 31st of 1517, Luther, though he probably didn't do it himself, had 95 theses nailed to the castle church door at Wittenberg. Now, this would not be like somebody come and nailing something to our door, which certainly wouldn't work because it's glass, not wood. The, the church door at that point in time probably would have been like a community, not probably, but was like a community bulletin board. And so he wasn't violating the church or defacing a church. He was simply posting his 95 theses on the door of the church there in Wittenberg, Germany, and he wanted to open up a discussion. I can't remember if it's 92 or 93 of his 95 theses dealt with um, the issue of indulgences and the selling of indulgences. Well, unbeknownst to him, he was a university professor. Some of his students removed the, um, the document from the door, took it to a printer, had it printed, and began circulating it through Germany. And it lit a fire through the whole world. We sit in this room today uh, as those who believe in grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, because of uh, Martin Luther and his uh, Re the Reformation that he started. Um, while we might be able to trace it ultimately back to, or uh, initially back to Martin Luther, we ought to trace it ultimately back to God. Uh, the Reformation was God's work, not Luther's or anybody else's. Um, but the material cause of the Reformation was sola scriptura. That is, that the authority for the church and for the believer is scripture alone. Not a pope, not a church, but scripture and scripture alone. The formal cause of the Reformation was sola fide. That is, or faith alone alone for salvation. What I mean by material cause and formal cause could be demonstrated by this pulpit. The material that this pulpit is made out of is wood, but its form is a pulpit because of the shape in which it takes. Ultimately, the defining battle of the Catholic Church against the Reformers was that of the nature of Scripture. That was what that battle was made out of. The Catholic Church said that the Pope is supreme over Scripture. The Reformers said Scripture uh, is God's ultimate rule for the church in the world. That was what the material of the Reformation was made out of. But the shape it took was over the doctrine of faith alone. The Catholic Church has long believed that, in fact, they often confuse it, and it comes in many different shapes, though they might deny it. Uh, the, but the bottom line is, uh, if you nail, nail a Catholic down, they're going to tell you that faith and works are the same thing. And so salvation is thus by grace through both Catholics and Protestants will say that salvation is only on the basis of God's grace. But a, reform, a, a Reformed or a Protestant church like us will say that that, um, that that grace comes through faith alone. Whereas the Catholic Church would say that, that salvation comes by both faith and works. Now, Scripture is not silent on the issue of faith and works, and we're going to look at that uh, today. But... Um, the issue in the Reformation was faith. And so we're going to see how that fire, how that division, how that return to biblical truth and biblical authority came about 500 years ago on Tuesday. That's a big day for the church in the world. But faith 
is uh, always in what we cannot see. But faith is not blind. What do I mean? Why do we believe when the trees blow and when, there's, uh, when we can hear it that there's wind? Has anybody here seen the wind? No, but we can see the effects of the wind. There is evidence, clear and ample evidence, for the fact that the wind blows and wind exists and air moves. So it is with faith. While faith is always in what we cannot see, our faith is not a blind faith. There is evidence for our faith. And that brings us from the Reformation to our text. Paul wants to give us evidence for the gospel that he has preached. And we're going to see four different instances of that evidence today. But before we can understand that, we have to understand the underlying problem uh, in the Greek culture. I don't think this was necessarily an underlying problem for the Corinthians. Uh, in fact, there's a, a fundamental shift in this chapter, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But turn with me back a couple of chapters to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And, and we're going to see here uh, some background information of the difficulty uh, that presented itself in the church in Corinth. Now, Corinth is a city in Greece, and so it was full of Greek believers. The context of Acts 17 uh, is a little different. Paul is in Athens here, so he's not in Corinth. But Paul, who wrote Corinthians to the church in Corinth that he founded, uh, is in Athens in Acts chapter 17. And he goes to the Areopagus. Uh, that is a, um, a, a Greek religious center in verse 22, and we see this. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens... I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. And what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And he goes on to proclaim to them the gospel. Verse 24, The God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. In other words, men of Athens and men and women of Athena don't believe that God needs you. Believe that you need God. Verse 26, and he made, and he made from one man every nation and of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Now fast forward, he's presented the gospel here. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole gospel um, because we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But he, he, an essential component of the gospel is a belief in the resurrection of Christ, and because of the resurrection of Christ, ultimately the resurrection of those who believe him to an eternity in heaven. And so we're going to, while we're going to talk more about the resurrection in a minute, I want us to understand that as Paul is preaching to them, that is included in his reasoning here. And in verse 32 we find this. Now when they heard of the resurrection, resurrection of the dead, some mocked. They mocked him for his belief in the resurrection of the dead. Now we looked at this as we went through 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that there was this fundamental belief in the Greeks that the flesh, the body, was almost like prison. And that this prison was uh, holding captive the soul. And they, they, uh, they were given to these uh, divine, i got to stop moving, these, these experiences by which they would have the, what we might call an out-of-body experience. Some would go into a trance-like state and they would, not, uh, they would just be unconscious on the floor. Others would utter in ecstatic, unknown, gibberish-type languages. And they believed that when this happened... <laughs> 
So they believed that when these uh, experiences, these out-of-body type experiences and unexplicable unknown languages, that their, their souls were being lifted above the prison of their flesh and they were having divine uh, or communion with their deity, some sort of divine communion. And so for the Greeks, the flesh, the body, was a prison that contained the soul. And so the, this idea that people would have their bodies resurrected to an eternity with a Savior was a ludicrous idea to them. And so the Greeks mocked Paul. The body's a prison. The body's worthless. We're looking forward to escape from the body to that which is real. And the gospel message is not that people will have their bodies done away with, but that someday Christ will return for his people and he will make their bodies new and give them glorified, resurrected, perfected bodies for all eternity. And so Paul, now we come to here in 1 Corinthians 15, to this chapter entirely devoted to the resurrection. This whole chapter covers the importance, the necessity, the effects, the response to, the future of, and the victory of the resurrection. It is all resurrection. Now this is, for the first time, in 1 Corinthians, which is unusual in Pauline literature, he's given us some, but this chapter, now, the, now we should note that chapters are not divinely inspired, they've been added at a later point in time, but this is the only chapter in 1 Corinthians devoted entirely to doctrine. It may be written to correct an underlying problem in the culture in Corinth, but I'll give you some evidence as to why I don't think that Paul is necessarily writing to correct the Corinthians. But even if it was written to correct a problem, uh, commentary after commentary after commentary I read said the same thing, and many of them must have been drawing on the same source or certainly agreed with commentaries. They all said this, whatever reason it was that caused Paul to put this chapter in this book, we are grateful. Because it is a glorious chapter, not only on the resurrection of Christ, but on the resurrection of us as well. And so, you know, actually, I misspoke. Uh, it, it is, I think, um, given to correct some doctrine that was attempting to be able to put, uh, to be put in the Corinthian church. Look with me at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? What I should have said is that what is, at, what is fundamentally at stake here, as Paul writes, is not the resurrection of Christ, but the resurrection of the Corinthians. And so Paul gives us this glorious chapter on our future in heaven, our resurrected bodies. And so um, the issue here isn't the resurrection of Jesus, but the issue of their resurrection. And the reason I say that is because Paul refers to them once again here as brothers. And so he writes to teach them of their resurrection and ours. But the foundation for our resurrection, the foundation for their resurrection, is the resurrection of Christ. And so that's where Paul starts. And that's what we're going to look at in these first uh, 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 15 here. The, the necessity and the importance uh, of the resurrection of Christ. John Locke, a 1700s and 18th century British, British theologian, said this, our Savior's resurrection is truly of great importance in Christianity. So great that his being or not being the Messiah stands or falls with it. And we're going to see that later in the chapter. The, the resurrection of Christ is the foundational doctrine to the Christian faith. There are lots of religious leaders in the world who are dead. There is only one who is resurrected. And if he has not been raised from the dead, we, as Paul says, of all men are most to be pitied. 
And so Paul starts out the discussion about their resurrection with the resurrection of Christ. And he wants us to be so firmly convinced of the resurrection that he offers us four witnesses, four proofs to the resurrection of Christ. And the first proof that he offers is the Corinthians him themselves. Look what he says in verses 15, 1 and 2. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers... Of the gospel, that word gospel means good news, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Why did Paul call them brothers? Because he preached and they believed. And they were therefore saved. He's going to give us the four, or really, uh, he's going to boil it down to two basic elements. And we see those over in verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised. He, they have placed their faith in Christ as the one who died for their sins and was raised again. He, Christ is able to offer life not, because, not only because he died, but because he also lives. The death of Christ is evidence of the curse. The death of Christ is evidence of the consequences and weight of sin. The resurrection of Christ is his proof, his evidence, God's vindication not only of what Christ did, but of the fact that his offer of eternal life is not a hollow offer. Why would we believe an offer of eternal life from someone who was dead? But we don't. We believe in eternal life from someone who lived. He calls them brothers because he preached the good news and they believe. Now, in these two verses, we're going to look at some verbs, some Greek verbs. Greek verbs don't work like English verbs. Greek word, verbs do some things different than English verbs. And so we need to understand them because there's a couple of really important nuanced details to see in the verbs throughout this chapter. We're going to look at two things. We're going to look at the tense of some of the verbs and we're going to look at the voice of some of the verbs. Now, what does that mean? The tense of verbs, this is easy. Verb tenses are past, present, and future. Something either happened in the past tense, it's happening in the present tense, or it's happening in the future tense. That most of us understand. Now, the, it can be divided even further down beyond that. If I say, um, I jumped, that's a past tense, right? But doesn't that imply a completed action? Sure. It's something I did in the past. But if I said I was jumping, you would still know that it was in the past, but you would know that it was an ongoing action, would you not? I'm doing something different with both past tense verbs there. There's also uh, voices to verbs. Now, we have two voices in English, and we're only going to look at these two voices. Greek has more voices, but we're only going to look at these two voices today. There is the passive voice and the active voice. In the active voice, the subject of a sentence does the verb. So, I hit Dave... I'm the subject. I have an active verb because I'm doing the action. Right? V is a very different statement than I was hit by Dave. I'm still the subject of the sentence, but rather than doing the action, the action is being done to me. That's the difference between an active verb and a passive verb. In an active verb, I'm doing the action. The subject is doing the action. In a passive verb, the, the subject is having the action done to them. Now, I'll remind you of what those are, but we're going to look at some verbs, and we're going to see what's going on with these verbs. Now, let's look at these verses again, and let's talk about some of the verbs here. Paul says, now I would remind you, brothers, he wanted them to remember. Their brothers, they've received the gospel, they've believed. He makes that clear. He actually says it twice in this passage. We preached, you believed. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. I would remind you of the gospel that I preached, past tense, to you, 
which you received, past tense. This is an aorist active. What does that mean? An aorist is a snapshot. It's the I jumped. It's a completed past tense action that happened in an instant. Paul had preached the gospel to them and they believed. Past tense, done. Well, actually the word here is received. I'm sorry, I should be using the proper verb here. But Paul, I preach to you, you received the gospel, that is you received the good news of Jesus Christ and of what he had done, in which you stand. Now is that past or present? Present. He's moved from past. I preached, you believed, and now you stand. You are standing right now in the gospel. Verse 2, and by which you are being saved, also present, right? Right now. He preached in the past, they believed in the past, they are standing now in the present, and they are being saved in the present. The interesting thing about this verb is not so much that it is in the present tense, but that it is in the passive voice. Paul preached the word. He did it. They received the gospel. They did it. They are standing in the gospel. It is something they are doing. Don't read too much theologically into those things. Paul is not saying that they're responsible for their salvation. He's just saying that it's something they're doing right now, but he changes the, the voice of the verb right here and says, by which you are being saved. Passive. In other words, someone or something else is doing the saving. That's important. They're not saving themselves. They're not contributing their own work to their salvation. This is the now and not yet aspect of salvation. When they believed, Paul preached, they believed they were saved. That is, they were forgiven from their sins. But now they are being saved. Now, this is really uh, an, an interesting word here because uh, not only is this word, well, yeah, not only is, well, let me go backwards a little bit, okay? I want to straighten some, some of this stuff out. I, I got ahead of myself. I should have paid better attention to my notes. Paul preached. That's what he did. He preached the gospel. He preached the good news of Jesus Christ. They received it. They believed in the gospel. They believed in the death and resurrection of Christ. And this in which you stand, though it occurs here in the present tense, is not really a present tense in the Greek. This is a perfect tense. Now, it is active. It's something that they did. But what is the perfect tense? Well, we don't really have the same type of perfect tense as the Greek does. The Greek perfect tense is a past tense action that has implications for the present. And the implication for the present is more important than the past action. Does that make sense? Paul preached, they believed, and they are now Standing in the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, brothers and sisters, as he's writing to them, you never outgrow the gospel. The gospel never becomes unnecessary to the Christian. We never move on from that doctrine. Hebrews is clear that we're supposed to grow up out of the elementary doctrines of Christ and into maturity. But though we might grow up in Christ, we never outgrow the gospel. They are standing in it at present. And because they are standing in it at present, they are being saved by what? The gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And then we come to one of the most gigantic words in this sentence. If, if, this is a conditional clause. If you hold fast, there's the future. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you. And what happens if we don't hold fast 
to the word preached, Paul says, unless you believed in vain. This word, these words in vain uh, quite literally mean, oh, I want to quote myself here because I don't want to, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, and where did I put this in my, my notes? Without purpose or without result is the exact translation. There is no room in Pauline doctrine for a faith that is not permanent. Pauline theology shows that time is the test of faith. Those who are saved while imperfect persevere by the power of the Spirit. Those who do not persevere show the insincerity of their faith. In other words, uh, to quote John Calvin, we believe in grace alone through faith alone. But we do not believe in faith that is alone. Those who have genuinely placed their faith in Christ for the remission of their sins, who have surrendered their soul to Christ as Savior, will and must hold fast to the word as preached. And to not hold fast is to have believed in vain. Now, let's be very clear about what we're saying. We are not saying that someone can lose their salvation if they stop believing. We say that someone who apparently stops believing was never Saved. I'm not going to turn there now for sake of time, but I would encourage you to in, in, investigate Hebrews chapter 3 and James chapter 2, particularly vor verses 14 through 17 of James chapter 2, to see this. James compares faith without works to the faith of demons. And then he poses the question, can that faith save you? James, the author of Hebrews, and Paul would all agree that saving faith is permanent faith. Here is the model, the, the, the model for evangelism in the church. It's simple. You ready? Because I looked it up before. Um, I don't remember the numbers. But you, I mean, I have a huge section on my shelf of how-to books on evangelism. They're everywhere. You can buy uh, how-to evangelism books like crazy on christianbook.com. Here's Paul's method of evangelism. We preached, you believed. That's it. It's not a difficult thing. Why? Because as we already saw in chapters 2 and 3, the Spirit of God has been given to those who believe. People's believing in the gospel is not dependent upon Paul, you, me, or anyone else. And so we preach, and if God is working, they believe. That is what the church is called to do. So he preached, so they believed. So what do we do as a church? We preach, people believe. That's it. There's nothing beyond that. How does this happen? Paul preached, they received, they are now standing and holding fast. Brothers and sisters... What is this a call for us to do? To hold fast. I've shared it before. I think it was in a Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Um, there's a, I can't remember what movie it is. Maybe it's Master and Commander. Anyways, it doesn't matter. It's a boat movie. People are on a boat. There's a storm. And there's a guy on the boat in the storm, this old salty sailor. And on his fingers, he's got tattooed Hold fast. That's what we do. We hold fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ and don't ever let go. The evidence of salvation for the Corinthians was their holding fast. I think the most powerful witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a changed life. I think there are people who knew me growing up who would confess the same. I've shared the story before. When people who I, in the church I grew up in started hearing that I was a pastor, I heard more than one time, and this is not a joke, you may laugh, I heard more than one time, well, God does have a sense of humor. By the grace of God, I'm not who I was. 
And by the grace of God in 10 years, I won't be who I am. But by the grace of God in 10 years, I fully intend to be holding fast. God loves us where we're at, but he loves us too much to leave us there. The greatest evidence of a changed life is the gospel. It's a silly joke, and I won't name the, the, uh, the religion, but somebody here told me a joke. If you take somebody from this false, religious, false religion fishing, you better take two. And the answer is always, well, why is that? The answer is, because if you only take one, he'll drink all your beer. <laughs> There's some truth to that statement, isn't there? Why is it that there is freedom in Christ and legalistic rules in other religions? Because in every other religion, there is no change of heart. Dead men don't change hearts. Christ is not dead. He changes hearts. The greatest testimony for the Corinthians and for us to the power of the gospel is that those who believe and surrender to Christ are not the same. And amazingly, and we should be encouraged, despite 14 chapters of Paul hammering on the sins of the Corinthians, they were not the people that they were when he came to the city of Corinth and planted that church. They were changed men and women. The second proof that he gives us is the scriptures. The scriptures. The scriptures are abundantly clear about who the Messiah was to be, where he was going to come from, what lineage he was to come from, and what he was going to do. The plan of God and salvation to send a Savior, to die for the sins of people, to be resurrected again, uh, was no secret plan. It was not hidden from ages past. It had been revealed in the scriptures. And Paul points us to the second evidence of the, uh, uh, of the resurrection of Christ as the scriptures. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance. Here we are again. What is most important? What do we hold fast to? The gospel. That's what he's about to give us. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And then, after telling us that Christ died for our sins, because of our sins, on account of our sins, to bear the wrath for the punishment of our sins, he not only did so in accordance with the scriptures, as God said he would do, but, verse 4, he was also buried. Who gets buried? Dead people. He didn't pretend to die. He didn't appear to die. He wasn't almost dead or mostly dead. He was all dead. And as proof to the fact that he died, he was buried. But not only was he buried, he was raised on the third day. Here's the statement again. In accordance with the scriptures. Now, the question that came to my mind when I first read this was, what scripture? What scripture was Paul thinking of? But you know what's interesting? The plural use of scriptures is almost absent in Pauline theology. When, when Paul, he's wrote 13 letters in the New Testament, and when he refers to a scripture in the Old Testament, he doesn't say, as it said in the scriptures, and then quote a verse. He says, as it said in the scripture, and quotes a verse. In other words, Paul's not thinking of a verse that tells us that Jesus would be dead, buried, and resurrected. He says that all of Scripture is about Jesus. All of it is about the fact that he would come, that he would die, that he would be buried, that he would be resurrected. I got news for you. The Bible, the Scriptures, is not about you and me. From Genesis to Revelation, the scriptures are about Christ. 
It's not a scripture that tells us that Jesus would be die, would die, be buried, and resurrected. It's all of scripture that tells us that Jesus would die, be buried, and would be resurrected. And just in case we weren't sure that there was evidence of that, after he says, in accordance with the scriptures, he says, and that he appeared to, and he's about to give us a list. In other words, Jesus died according to the scriptures, and the evidence is that he was buried. He was resurrected according to the scriptures, and the evidence is that he appeared. Notice that Paul doesn't say he was seen by. That is subjective to experience. Jesus wasn't seen by certain people. He appeared objectively to them. The Corinthians had lots of experiences. And for the Corinthians, the, the greatest determining factor of truth was experience. Paul completely eliminates that possibility. He says it's not about who experienced a vision of Christ. Jesus actually appeared. From verse 3b, what do I mean by b? Paul says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Now, after that, from the word that in verse 3 all the way through the end of verse 8, every verb, except for the two about the 500, every verb is, uh, is a, Jesus is the subject of. Jesus is the subject of all of the verbs in Paul's explanation of the gospel. The Corinthians weren't. You and I aren't. The witnesses aren't. The subject of this whole passage about the scripture's prediction of Jesus and Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, it is all about him. He is the subject of it all. I came across this quote in the Pillar New Testament commentary. This is rich. Listen carefully, please. Paul's accounting of the gospel message reflects the fact that it is first and foremost a message about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, rather than being a message primarily about us and how we can be saved. Listen to that again. Paul's recounting of the gospel message reflects the fact that it is first and foremost a message about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us rather than being a message primarily about us and how we can be saved. And then listen to this. Hold on to your seats. It is Christ's story which gives meaning to our lives, not our story which gives meaning to Christ's life. We don't give meaning or value to the gospel at all. It is all about Christ. He is the meaning. He is the value. He is the subject. He is the object. We are just the beneficiaries of what he has done for us. Uh, I, uh, I love the quote from John MacArthur that says, The only thing we contribute to our salvation is the sin that made it necessary. That's it. That's all we bring to the table. But the scriptures, not only do the changed lives of the Corinthians attest to the truth of the resurrection, and not only do the scriptures attest to the truth of the resurrection, but there were eyewitnesses to the truth of the resurrection. I think I, here's a note I wrote to myself in my notes that I think is maybe worth uh, reading. The gospel is that God planned to redeem a people according to the scriptures. Christ accomplished the means for that salvation. And the Spirit applies it when he grants us faith to believe. What role do I play in all of that? Nothing. I just surrender my life to his sovereign control. It's all about him. We don't study my story. We study his story. That's what the word history means. How is, it that the, how is it that the Corinthians believed and received the gospel? By the absolute and unconditional surrender of their lives to Christ. An absolute and unconditional surrender doesn't come easy to us. We've got to rely on the Holy Spirit for that. But it's worth it. <laughs> 
It's worth it. The third eyewitness to, or the third witness to the resurrection of Christ is the eyewitnesses. In other words, before I even read this, here's the point I would make. Here's what Paul is saying to you and me. Just in case you don't believe your own changed lives and the, the prophecy given in Scripture, just go ask the people who have seen him. And he gives us these uh, five examples before he gets to himself. First, he appears to Peter, who he refers to here as Cephas. That's his Hebrew name. Then he re uh, refers to the twelve. Judas had died. Matthias hadn't been appointed. Paul wasn't selected as an apostle. So it was actually eleven. The twelve was a name that quickly became associated with the apostles. So he appeared to Peter. Then he appeared to the apostles. Then he appeared to 500 people all at once. Then he appeared to James. The question here is what James? There were two disciples named James, and Jesus had a brother named James. I'll get to which one I think it is and why in a minute. And then he appeared to all of the apostles. That is all of the people that Jesus had appointed to minister to him. Look with me at verse uh, 5. He appeared to Cephas then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are alive. There's Paul's statement of, go check it out for yourself. Dave and I were hunting this week. I saw a 20-foot tall elk. You can go ask him. If I gave you some kind of outrageous story and I wanted you to believe it, I'm going to tell you to go check with the eyewitnesses. What's the first thing a cop does when something happens? He wants to know who saw it and what they saw. Paul's not saying this is a, some kind of secretive thing that didn't happen in public. He says there are 500 people who he appeared to. They saw, him, they saw him alive. Most of them are alive. Go check it out for yourselves. We believe, we have faith in something we cannot see, but there is evidence for what we believe, and Jesus gave that evidence. And not only did he appear to the 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are alive, though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. I think this James is his brother. I think the two James who were apostles had probably been martyred already at the time of this writing, but James, who wrote the book of James, is uh, Jesus. Jesus' brother, Jude, who wrote the book of Jude, was also Jesus' brother. If you notice Jesus' brothers in the Gospels, most of the time we see them, they're mocking him. What would it be that would take a, a mocker of Christ, somebody who hated Jesus, his brother? I mean, could you imagine? Could you imagine growing up in a house with a sibling who never sinned, never did anything wrong, never got disciplined, never got in trouble? How many times do you think they may, he did, they didn't have parents who, who were sinless. Mary and Joseph were sinful. So how many times do you think James and Jude heard, why can't you just be more like Jesus? Of course they hated him. What would take these brothers who hated him and turn them into authors of scripture and leaders in the church? Well, imagine if your brother died and then was resurrected and showed up at your door. My aunt about fell over one day when I hadn't seen her for years. I knocked on her door, and if you've ever seen a picture of my dad, I look just like him. She about passed out until she realized it was me and not him. But imagine if her dead brother had showed up on her doorstep. Something would have to change. This isn't a hollow thing. Jesus showed up. He was there. People saw him. And the fourth witness, and I'll move quickly here, is the Apostle Paul. Uh, I want to move quickly, but I want to take my time to look at one thing here. Verse 8, last of all, as to one untimely born, almost impossible to translate, typically gets re used to refer to one of two things, this untimely born. That is a premature birth or an abortion. An aborted uh, baby would be an untimely born baby. The vast majority of the use of this word would refer to a baby that had been aborted. Abortion is nothing new. If you haven't signed the abortion stuff out here, please do. Abortions happened 2,000 years ago. And I think Paul is using the grotesque image of himself as an aborted baby. Why? Why? 
Because you and I are all born spiritually dead. Not just stillborn. I mean, we're all stillborn. But I think he sees himself worse than stillborn. Why? Verse 9, he gives us the reason. For, here's his reason. For I am the least of all the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Persecuted means that he had permission from the Sanhedrin to seek out, find, gather, and execute Christians. He oversaw the stoning of Stephen in Acts. What made Paul the greatest, most zealous Jew made him an aborted fetus in the church of God. We bring nothing to the table but our own sin that makes us ugly and dead. And if you've ever seen the pictures of an aborted fetus, they are not pretty. Paul believed himself to be the worst of the apostles. So why would he use himself as an example? Because he wants us to see what the gospel can do. Look at verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Not by his own work, his own zeal, or his own effort, but solely by God's grace, he is what he is. And his grace, that is God's grace towards me, was not in vain. He warns them in verse 2, don't believe in vain. Hold fast. Cling tight to the gospel. And I am a picture of that because I'm the ugliest of the ugly. I killed the church. I persecuted it. I wanted you all dead. But look what God's grace can do even to me, the most ugly of sinners. If there's hope for Paul, there's hope for us all. And because of this, because his, 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 this salvation was not in vain, not to toot his own horn, but to show the greatness of what the gospel can do. On the contrary, he worked harder than any of them. Though it wasn't him, it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. He's going to great length here to show us that anything that he did, 13 letters in the New Testament, uh, countless churches saved, probably the greatest evangelist since uh, Jesus, none of it was because of him. None of it was because of his natural ability. None of it was because of his talent. All of it was because of the grace of God. Paul's life was a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. He tried to kill everyone who believed in the resurrection until Jesus appeared, last of all, to, as one untimely born, the ugliest of the ugly, to him. And it wasn't in vain because God's grace made him hugely effective in the kingdom of God. And so whether it was I or they, the apostles, the 500, whoever, it doesn't matter who did the work, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. There it is. We preach and people believe. If you have not been saved from your sin by grace through faith, today is the day you need to surrender. If you have not been saved from sin by faith in Christ, what do we have to believe about Christ to be saved? Four things. Four things we believe. One, that Jesus is the God who created. Two, that he became a man. Three, that he died to bear the wrath of his father on the cross. And four, that he was raised to a victorious life. We believe in grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but don't dare let that be faith that is alone, because faith without works is dead. If you have believed, get out there and share the gospel. It's not hard. The power is in the message, not the messenger. Father, we thank you that the power of the gospel is, this, is your Holy Spirit. That it is not in us and our ability to speak. Father, we're encouraged by the fact that we read in Scripture that Paul was not eloquent 
He was not strong of speech, nor was Moses or many others. The effectiveness of Paul's ministry was you. And Father, we pray that you would be the all-sufficient power in our ministry. Father, let our faith not be in vain. Let us not gather and hide as I'm even reminded in this moment of how the apostles did. But when you appeared to them, it lit a fire in them, a bold and mighty fire to go out and preach the gospel. Father, because of the resurrection, light a bold and mighty fire in us to share the gospel. Father, we know that whether people surrender or not is not up to us, but up to you. And so, Father, we ask that you would use your word and your spirit mightily to redeem sinners, to call your elect out of the world and to save and sanctify them. Lord, let us preach and let them believe and stand and hold fast. Father, we pray that we would hold fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we would never think we outgrow it or we move beyond it but that we would cling to it to save our lives like those sinking on a, on a ship. And that we would have great boldness to share with others that they too can hold fast and be saved. Do it all for your glory because it's all about you and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.